What's going on, Clippers fans? Welcome to Season 2, Episode 63 of Clips and Dip. I am Chuck Mockler, still here. Adam Oslin, still here. William Updike, we are still here covering the Clippers for you. Can you uh, believe it? I hope you're... Thank you for still being here, if you're listening or watching. Uh, podcast audience, through us, thick and thin. YouTube, little bandwagony, but that's okay. Um... We're going to talk, I don't even think we have anything about the game against the 76ers in here, because uh, we're just going to talk another state of the Clippers talk kind of thing. Um, we have some facts about Clippers ships to share with everyone later to kind of lighten the mood. Adam, before, are you going to share some footage? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I actually, yeah. well, I, uh, I downloaded it, then I transferred it over to beta max mm. and then i lit that bitch on fire okay I, and so yeah i literally burned the footage you from digital it. to analog to scorched earth it's kaput. doesn't exist anymore it's gone the clippers have killed the high five which i which makes me genuinely upset really funny <laughs> it's funny they killed it but it's really sad at the same time it I thought about it earlier today, and then I thought about what I watched last night and yesterday, and I just didn't have it in me to go through and decide between so many bad clips and possessions. I mean, you could have just only done the fourth quarter. Yeah. I, yeah first uh, four, first couple first, plays of the fourth. Yeah. Sure. Go from being down eight to down 16 in a minute 46. I, I, there's obviously bigger issues than just breaking down individual tape. Sure. For those of you who missed it, if you want to watch the old high fives, they're on our old or not very old episodes over on youtube.com slash that Clippers podcast. I, I could show one, just let's do it. One quick one here. Roll the clip. Sure. Real quick. And it's really, I don't know. It's not. Make sure the sound is off. Okay, I'll make sure the sound is off this time. You sound is off. Tabs you have open. <laughs> yeah. <Watch the> tabs. <laughs> so this this is a tab called X. So look out. But uh, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> here's here's some footage. Uh, you guys see what I'm seeing? I'm getting close. You right enhance. I just uh, went yeah, full screen. Enhanced. This is off somebody else's TV recording. Tell Here's tell. Kawhi coming over to help the out. The sound is on of the video. Just adds up. What do you mean it's on? <laughs> when I when I enlarged it, no worries. All it good. Went back on. So, uh, oh, that was a nice. Hey, deal. yeah, there we nice go. Nice out by Paul George. But here's a mere coffee, uh, letting his defender get by him to the point where Kawhi Leonard has to come over and help, and then pointed Avica Zubats immediately afterwards to let him know it should have been him. Blocking that shot. That is a and Zoo is like team. I'm right here. <laughs> yeah, I'm not I'm not sure he was, to be yeah, honest. I don't I don't think he's he's getting to this one. In fact, somebody get like look at look at the hesitation yeah. there and maybe, maybe he's but for something it seems like he's not anticipating. This could just be frustration boiling over, and it's just where the clippers are at right now. So I guess. It was worth sharing the, uh, what was it? The high one. The high one is the what we're calling one. it, right? Yeah. The high one. <laughs> I've been, uh, yeah, some of us have been called the high one before. Uh, Will, I got to go on and do the double dip with Adam after the show last night. It was supposed to, or the game last night was supposed to be a triple dip. But technical difficulties. Do you want to talk about your feelings on the game last night, Will? You didn't get a public forum to shout at like I got. <laughs> Oh, I mean, it sucks. This team sucks. I left during the fourth. How early? Uh, I think there were probably seven or eight minutes left in the quarter. But you knew. That's you knew that. so over. It was over. How many times do we have to watch them do the exact same thing? Like they they were down they they were down twenty and still not playing defense. Like. You can't trade buckets at that point, fellas. You got to get some stops. Well, isn't this the real issue going on, though, right now? You're down five against Philly. You head into the fourth quarter, 
And within a couple of minutes, you're down 20. Yeah. And then last night, you're down eight. It's manageable easily from what we've seen from this team coming back with 12 minutes left, down eight. And instead, a minute 46 later, they're down 16. They're calling a timeout. Kawhi Leonard's back in the ball game, and they're just not punching back. They're not fighting back. They're not uh, battling a run with one of their own. This one was more disappointing because in that Sixers game, we did not see Kawhi Leonard in the fourth. Um, I think smartly Ty Lue tried to adjust to try to right the ship in the fourth in this one, bringing Kawhi in earlier, and it just – that's what made it all the more pathetic. They they couldn't make it five minutes without the game getting so out of hand to bring Kawhi back in in that Sixers game. It's crazy. It doesn't they everyone else forgets how to play basketball when Kawhi's off. Um, but he, like Will said, even with him last night, the lead yeah. extended when he got in there at the night. It was ball. not inspired play. It was not inspired play. I don't blame Kawhi. I mean, obviously, it's not on one guy, but man, that was uh, it's just not. I don't know. It, I, it's it's not just the intangibles for why that happened to start. I think both of those fourth quarters and a lot of these fourth quarters going back to what happened against the Lakers when you're up by 21. There's been some bad lineups, guys. To start that fourth quarter last yeah. night, having Russell Westbrook, PJ Tucker, and Abitza Zubats out there on the floor, like it, there's an actual reason you get down that much that quickly. We watched yeah, Russell Westbrook turn down a three to give it up to PJ Tucker, who doesn't normally want to take them. He hoisted it. It ends up going over the backboard, and that was their first possession of the fourth quarter. They have three non shooters out there. And Russ and didn't get stops. And Russ played well. They wasted an efficient Russ game, which you got to take advantage of. You got to take advantage of the efficient Russ offense games. Yeah, you, it's, it's nice too for your team to do that. Um, the PJ Especially Tucker with thing, how many people said Russ will change things for this team. He right. plays well last night. Obviously, there are oh, much shit. bigger issues than just it being about one guy. Sure. For those people that thought it would be that simple to get Russ back when they were three and five in his last eight games anyways, and he was there for the 21-point turnaround by the Lakers. He was a big part of how that happened. So I don't know where this narrative came that uh, they just need their heart and soul back, and that's going to fix everything. I'm glad he's back. He played great last night. Yeah, They just have so many pressing issues right now. You can't put it on one guy to have to fix all that and put all the pressure on Russ to figure out what's going on with this Clippers team. P.J. Tucker was also getting blown by by T.J. McConnell. Some TJ on PJ crime, which has to be the first time that's ever happened. But that was they were trying any any team when PJ Tucker's out there is PJ trying McConnell to- looks like a goddamn all star in this. <laughs> he game. looked so good. I hated it. I was so upset. <laughs> Look how bad the defense was. Not yes. Yeah, nothing against McConnell. He's a nice player. He would be of a great to have on as your bench guard. But he should not be lighting you up for like ten plus in a at course. the rim. Like te- like butt points directly at the rim, like just going straight at you. Um, He's not a good shooter. Like, why yeah. are you getting blown by like this? You know that was that's what he's trying to do. <laughs> so Paul George doesn't think the Clippers have an identity. James Harden doesn't think the Clippers have an identity. Uh, Tyloo said the team is soft. This that's is their identity. That's this their is, identity. Yes. That's probably the best part of last night, honestly. So the pregame presser was one of the more despondent. Despondent, but he was still just testy, but not at the press kind of way. You know, vibe. It seemed like he was at the end of his rope with the situation. It felt like talking to a teacher who was like, you know, when you go and visit a teacher, maybe, you you know, you graduate high school. You're like, oh, I'm going to go say what's up to so-and-so. I haven't seen them. And And you talk to him and you're like, oh, wow. You are so tired of this. <laughs> like, Yeah, you get you, the unfiltered kind of. <laughs> you are exhausted from trying to make this work um, is what it felt like pregame. And then postgame, it was just like, I mean, we got absurd quotes to get this late in the season for a team that's supposed to win a championship. That are correct quotes is the other part. No one was talking super crazy. They're, they The players don't think they have an identity. The coach just says they're soft. That's kind of what's happening right now. I thought he was going to say that. I think he was on the verge of saying that back when they had their most recent loss to the Minnesota Timberwolves, the last time around, because 
he started to get frustrated saying that's what bothers me the most after they went on that run and the Clippers did nothing about it in the second half. He just felt like they were getting punked out there. They weren't mentally tough enough. Therefore, soft. And that is what we're seeing right now. A team whose will is easily broken with one run in the fourth quarter where they don't respond. It's a lay. It's a layup line of them getting stepped over, like Ty Ala Ty Lu, except for instead of being stepped over by one of the greatest guards of their time, it's by fucking TJ McConnell and literally every other team. So it's great. I saw um, one of the most famous Clippers fans, uh, Paul Shear, was on Twitter, kind of asking like if this identity thing is a cop out, and so it is. I saw it, but he thinks it's, he's, I think he said, it's like, is it a cop-out to get out of, uh, like interview questions? And I was like, no, but it, it is a cop-out on their part. Like it's them being like, I guess we just don't know what our identity is. And it's like, but you had a piece of it before. It's them. You like, played hard before on defense. They were a good yeah. defense, right? Adam, they had a very good rating at one uh, point. They yeah, can't like say the on first... the mic, we think we're good enough and this is below <laughs> us. You can't say that because, but that's how they're playing. They were a top five defense this season, which was their goal coming into it, for literally about two and a half weeks. Mm, okay. Then when their offense really kicked in with James Harden, it slipped. It went to about average. But you can live with that when you're in God mode on the offensive end. Right. You're okay with that. And some of it was to be expected because when you know you can score every time down, which is basically what they were doing when they had that 122 offensive rating and they were the best team in the league for two months. Yeah, there's probably going to be slippage on the defense event. What has happened since the Grammy road trip is more than alarming. Last 22 games, they are 29th defensively. There is one team that they have been better than, and that is the Utah Jazz, a team that is currently tanking. That's unacceptable for a team that even Coach Lou reiterated it last night. Here's our identity, at least what they were trying to be. Uh, a tough-minded defensive team, an explosive offensive team, a tough-minded defensive team. They may have the personnel, but they don't have the mindset Did at you all. Did you see the stat uh, Joey Lynn put out today uh, that the Clippers' defensive rating? Uh, I responded to it with James Harden. Yeah, that's crazy. I'm not I, blaming I don't think James, it's... obviously. Well, let They've me provide some overall. context to that. Yeah, when you're 29th defensively, everyone's bad. <laughs> Terrence Mann is 121. He's right next right. to James Harden. Amir Coffey's right next to him. Avita Zubac is right next to him. So I think it's a little bit. I don't know. I, I love Joey, but it seems to be pointing a little bit too much at James Harden there when it's like, okay, but everybody has a really bad defensive rating for the most part. At least some guys that are known for giving effort on that end specifically, like right. Terrence Mann, if he has almost the same defensive that's rating right. as James Harden, how much can we really put into that? Yeah, that's Since a good call break. about the known defensiveness of those guys. Because like Norm having a bad defensive rating, you're like, yeah, okay. <laughs> sure. He's right there too. <laughs> but but Avisa Zubat, Amir Coffee, and Terrence Mann are all right there. Yeah. So what are we talking about? I look. How I'm do not we get him to be Ben Harden's defense? Oh it has, no no it's no. Been no. worse, definitely. Yeah. But everybody is completely disconnected. When you are 29th defensively for 22 games, that is 25 percent of the season, guys. Yeah. How do they get? out of this is it possible are we out of possibility because it's it's really just them locking in i think it's, it's possible. my thing my thing is like if you can flip this if you think you can flip the switch why hasn't it been flipped like I, I just don't understand like if if it's that simple yeah i can understand looking lackluster through three quarters of a game turning it on pulling it out that's just not what i'm seeing I just don't I like I don't know how there's any belief that suddenly they're going to be good again. The switch right now is in a compound about a mile away like in Jurassic Park where Ellie had to go past some raptors to get there to turn the power back on. Mm -hmm. Like first they have to get to the switch and that's going to take some time. There's a treacherous road to get there. There's raptors. You got Muldoon with you saying clever girl but yeah, it's it's not that simple right now. There are steps along the way. 
And they're running out of runway, which is a phrase we've said a lot over the 213 era. The runway is getting shorter, I believe, is the usual phrase we use. And it's about as short as it can get. They need a chopper. They're... They need a chopper. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're not landing. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's not very good. before Because we are going to talk about playoffs and play in. Uh, in a sec, is there anything I, else? I don't think it's. I don't think it's crazy though. To your question, your initial question there, can they turn this remember. around? Do they have enough time to turn it around? Got it. I'm going to make this point: as fast <laughs> as things turn for the worse, just like when they were down, losing their first five games with James Harden, things turn quickly the other way. It's not impossible for that same thing to happen again. We've already seen it turn for the worse, then for the best, then for the worst again. Do we have another upshot? <laughs> like, well, and the other thing is, is like in terms of, uh, I mean, I mean, there is still around ten percent of the season left to go, so there is some runway. It's not completely gone. Um, and then the other thing, like even as cynical and down as I've been on this team. We are another Kawhi Leonard historic playoff performance away from this team being clawed to a potential Western Conference final. Like it's not, you know, it's not insane. I just think that that's the thing that's so infuriating is that this team has this in their DNA. And I, I just think to approach the regular season this way, um, I, I just feel like it's a little bit foolish to to just assume on that. And I think that you know, not having home court at any point, I, that's going to wear down on you. All this stuff is going to wear down on you. I just don't know. I mean, it's some, it's likewise, like we, I've talked about like with microcosms of how the Clippers run their offense or how they refuse to play defense. Like they continuously put themselves in harder and harder positions. And yes, they're good. Yes. There are four hall of famers on this team. Of, of course, like of, of course there is always the potential for them to do something really crazy. I just don't know why it's already really hard to win an NBA championship and you're going to go ahead and like give yourself the, the absolute hardest way to go about, to go about it. Like it just doesn't make sense. to me. Are they looking at it the same way we have Kawhi just get us to the playoffs healthy, get out of the play in and not be in that position and we'll be fine. Cause there's a faction of fans that believe that still. I there saw are, that. There I, aren't saw many, some, I saw some takes but... that people are overreacting and that Ty Lu <laughs> is, is is playing these bad lineups to like save his hand for the playoffs. And like I I gotta tell you, man, I don't think it's that deep. And if you yeah. look at Ty Lu and some of his reactions to this game, I don't think he's planning any of this, man. I if, actually if... want to be playing bad before the playoffs. <laughs> Like, the fuck are we doing here? Chess Master 3000. <laughs> yeah. If the team is this concerned, you might want to have a little bit of concern about them as well. I'm just saying, if there's a question about identity and there seems to be friction between at least uh, a Somebody. mixed message between the head coach and the players at this point, I think that's safe to say. If two players are saying we don't have an identity, if the coach is saying we do, but it's soft. We're soft. I don't know how you can spin that into a positive right now. Like this is right where we need to be. We're right in the slot and now we're falling down the standings. You know what? We're going to come out of that seven, eight matchup. It's going to be, what, what are we talking about here? Like you are dangerously close to falling into the play on plan. That is a realistic possibility right now. Very should be, realistic. Should it be called the play on instead of the play in? Cause I think I like play on better. I don't know. <laughs> I think it's a yes. All right, we're going to talk the playoffs and the play on after this break because there is some interesting just strength of schedule stuff to look at. Um, wish we didn't have to look at this to feel better about not being in the play-in, but here we are. Um, so if you're listening to this, thank you for listening. If you're watching, appreciate that too. Uh, on audio, there might be some loud ads. We're talking the play on after these loud ads in three, two. Hey, what's going on? Welcome back into Clips and Dip. Look, we've lamented a little bit about where the Clippers are at, but we're not quite done yet. Uh, we still have to talk about the playoffs and seeding and the potentiality for the Clippers to be in the play-in, which I still, again, as someone who has been very cynical on this team, I don't think they're going to fall that low. I, I, do not, I do not suspect they're going to fall to six. 
I do not suspect that they have the capacity to fall even lower than that. But uh, Charles, you you wrote up this outline. Talk to me. What's <laughs> what's going on with this? Uh, so as I agree, I don't think they're going to fall to the play in. Uh, as of this recording, the Clippers are fifth, but the Pels are down 18 to the Thunder right now. So we're going to be jostling between four and five uh, for the next 10 games, pretty much. The Pels, of course, have the tiebreaker over the Clippers. The Clippers are two games up on the Kings and Mavs, who are six and seven. And they're two and a half games up on the Suns, who are eighth. All of these teams, uh, the Kings and, or sorry, Suns and Kings have the hardest remaining schedule based on opponent win percentage. Um, and the Pels have the third hardest schedule based on opponent win percentage. So the Clippers do get a break in who these other teams play in that regard. They're playing good teams down the stretch. The Clippers do have to play the Suns twice um, to, to finish this, this one out. But I don't think we actually get – I don't think we fall into the plan. I don't think – I think that would be – What about sixth? Sixth? What percentage chance would you put on that? Hmm. We're two games up on the Kings. We play the Kings again. I would put that at nine and a half percent. I think it's honestly a lot higher. Really? Only because – so the Clippers are one and nine against teams with a winning record coming out of the all-star break. And that's We're bad. looking at schedules remaining and who has the tougher schedule right now. Any team that's above 500 is being the Clippers. <laughs> right. I Very can't say the point. same for the Phoenix suns or the Sacramento Kings or the Dallas Mavericks. I feel like they're going to go 500 at least against those teams at worst. And the Clippers, I mean, being in a game in Philly against a team that just beat you and lit you up in the fourth quarter and is going to be very confident and is going to have the crowd behind them and is going to be on top of James Harden and trying to wreck the Clippers yeah. season even more. Mm -hmm. That is a really tough game to start off this road trip. And then what? Orlando on Friday? Yeah. Orlando on Friday. So... So you one think and one, most, I think, is what most people would sign up for there. They're not, I would I, love that. <laughs> so so I, you think it's six? You think it's more likely to be six or five? I don't think it's more likely. I think it's a lot higher than 9%, though. I think it really... I 12%. 25. I think it's like, I think it's like 30. Okay. I, I really do. Because, okay, they have one more game against Sacramento. They're two and one against the Kings so far. So they win that game, they'd have the tiebreaker. They're 2-0 and against Phoenix so far with two games remaining. That's all in their favor. But just going off how they're playing, the vibes <laughs> the of the of team, and given that those teams are above 500 and the Clippers aren't beating them, unfortunately, yeah, I think there's probably like a 30% chance. Like if this – free fall continues here, which it could with the next two opponents being on the road and being good opponents. I don't know what's stopping it. That Clippers Suns is a back-to-back -back away. And then home we play in Phoenix. And then the next day, all the teams travel, the teams travel together and then play in LA. That's insanity. Anyway, sorry. I agree. They get reprieve against the Hornets on Sunday but, hell, who knows how that's going to go. Um, the Kings do have the Dallas Mavericks, their next two games at home. Yeah. Another team they're fighting with to try to stay out of the playing tournament. Those will be highly competitive games. But yeah. the Clippers aren't competing. They're not pushing back. It's just... If it's more than just talent or tired legs and there's something going on in the locker room, which I think a lot of people are speculating about right now because how do you go from winning 26 or 31 like games to now being 10 and 12 yeah. and losers of what, six of their last nine? Five at home too. They have the worst record in their last 10 games outside the Golden State Warriors of the top 10 teams in the Western Conference. The Warriors are tied with them. They're both four and six. Everybody is playing better than them. 
Will, At least are, the teams they're competing against. You're not. You're right. Will, what do you think? What's your playoff scenario? What's the Updike playoff scenario? I don't know. I, I honestly, you know, I don't think either matchup is that great for the Clippers. Um, oh, again, sure. I, th- I think that they can get through it. Um, but, yeah, like I said, I think there's like a 25 to 33% chance that they could end up at six. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. So what Ty Lue said yesterday, like, makes me think that maybe Paul George is a malcontent in the locker room. I don't know, like, what end that's affecting everybody else, but um, it doesn't uh, it doesn't bode well. And I don't know. Either one of these matchups from what we've seen in the regular season is, is not going to be great for the Clippers. It's going to be really, really hard. Like I said, the only thing that, that gives you hope is the talent that they have. Um relative to, to both of these other teams yeah on paper hey love it love it on paper right now do you on paper you love you love pels clippers on paper no i love what the clippers have on paper i don't know if i oh. love that match i love what the clippers have on paper clippers pels uh that if the clippers don't have home court advantage even if they do that's going to be a bloodbath and but it's and just then if they fall to six theory. it's Timberwolves. Right. I'll tell you what, if they end up getting home court advantage, which means the four seed right now, I'd be feeling a lot more optimistic about this squad because that means they're winning games and playing much better basketball all of a sudden. That's what it's going to take to get the four spot. Yeah, that's a good call. It could happen. It could turn very quickly back in their favor, just like it turned against them. It could. Well, and like they're, they're, I mean, obviously they're much closer to four than they are six. So, right. Yeah. It takes some uh, solace in that. It just oh. does feel like a free fall right now <laughs> because of, of how they're playing. Um, I think I've, there's been a lot of talk on Clippers Twitter about uh, Kawhi and PG's field goal attempts and things like that. And I've, you know, we've said it on the show, like when the playoffs happen, their field goal attempts go up. That's how it goes. I'd be okay with starting that pre playoffs. I'm fine with them shooting more before we have to do it in the playoffs, right? Let's get them into a rhythm. Let's ride the best players on the team's offensive skill. Who says no? I'm all for that. I'd like James Harden to join them in that excursion of let's do it. Taking more shots. Yeah. That journey to attempt more shots as he just attempted seven yesterday. And for the first time since 2012 in a game where he played at least 30 minutes. So the first time since he hasn't been an OKC Thunder, he only took one three-pointer. That's the first time in over a decade that he played that many minutes and only attempted one three-point shot, James Harden. And Coach Lou was asked post-game about his shoulder injury and if there's something going on there by La Murray, wondering if, okay, does he not want to hoist from the outside? Is that why he's not shooting as much? Is he just not healthy? And that could be playing a big factor on all this. As much as, look, I said it a few weeks ago, but if we're going to credit James Harden, and we did, sure. for the big turnaround and the big run they went on, I think it's also fair to look back his way now that the Clippers are reeling and saying what's going on. I'm not saying it's all on him or anything like that, but it may be a significant reason that if the system is broken right now, the same one that had them running at a high power to high level offense for so long, for two months, for almost half the season, 40% of the season, they looked that good. We're not talking about a couple of weeks where the Clippers showed us a flash of greatness. We're talking right. about 31 games. Uh, I think it's worth looking into what's going on with James Harden and saying, okay, it's, forget the defensive stuff. Though It's been there. When they right. were good, those lapses in that video that Joey posted, that stuff was still happening. The difference is when he juices up your offense that much where you're in God mode, it easily makes up for those defensive yeah. mistakes. Also, when other guys are playing better defensively and are more connected and are giving a better effort and communicating out there, that also easily makes up for Harden's deficiencies. It's been like that most of his career. So... I don't know. Is James Harden the first thing we should be looking at right now with this Clippers late season swoon? Is that 
I don't want to point all the fingers his way. I'm saying, is that the biggest slice of the pie of what has changed? He's not playing as well. Therefore, the Clippers aren't playing as well. We wondered if they were too dependent on him in a recent episode. I think there's definitely something to it. If you look at, right, I mean, you can't, yeah, you can't be the driver of the team when they're good and then be in the backseat when they're bad um, with how we talk about him. He's averaging his fewest field goal attempts since 2011. Um, he's averaging 11 and a half field goal attempts per game, which I understand there's Kawhi and Paul George out there, but that's way too low. <laughs> that's, that's too low. Um, I think the health thing is a great point. I think these guys, part of what we heard in the pre in the preseason, which they have adhered to is that they were going to take the regular season more seriously when it came to, you know, if the guys are healthy, they're going to play. Now it seems like we're kind of in this scenario where guys are kind of healthy and so, therefore, they're kind of playing when they're on the court, right? Like, I think there might be something to the he's not healthy thing. Fully healthy. He's not healthy. They're an older team. There's tired legs going on. He's not getting downhill enough. He's not getting too on the ball as much as he was before. I don't know what the numbers say about that. Uh, I know there was somewhat of a decline I heard recently when it came to drives per game from Harden over the last month. That tracks, that matches the eye test, certainly. Uh, and just the fact that Coach Lou even said it last night, you know, Harden's a guy who always wants to play. Right. You got to save guys like that from themselves, though. You can't let them wear down over the season when they're 34 years of age, when you know he's like this. I. They gave him those two days off, or those two games off recently, where Bones shined and won against the Chicago Bulls. The other one was against the Pelicans. And by the way, that Pelicans game, I was thinking earlier, how many games recently have the Clippers given a really good effort for the most part? The whole way through. One of them, at least the majority of it, what you'd expect from a team that yeah. has championship ex expectations. I mean, Jerry Rice took plays off. Everybody does at times. <laughs> it happens. But the Pelicans game on the road, for the most part, they were locked in without James. The other game was the game without 2-1-3 against the Milwaukee Bucks that they almost won against Giannis and Dame. Right. They played way harder and together like a cohesive unit and had more energy. I, and, you know, people keep saying, you know, the depth, the depth just isn't there like, like we thought. It's like, okay, there's something to that. But also, look at that game. When they had to rely on their depth, they played really well. So it's just weird how spotty and up and down it's been. Some people want to point to the Lakers game and saying it all stems from giving up that 21-point lead in the fourth quarter, and they haven't been the same since. But then you go, okay, a couple games later, they came back on Minnesota down 16 and got their only win against them on the road. And then they gave up a 15-point lead to Milwaukee, and then they came back down 20 against Houston. I, so if you're talking about identity and who are they, I, yeah, that is a moving target of who are you because <laughs> – I don't know which Clippers team is showing up every night. It's strange. Will, how are you feeling? Not great. <laughs> Am I making it worse? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I don't know. I don't know. The Stars thing, I mean, the team goes as far as they take us. And if they're tired right now, that's how far we're going to get. Right, like, but then why? I just still, I still don't understand why do it why? like this. Right, why do it like the, this? But just take the games off, man. Like I, I don't know what else to say. Should, Go out swinging. Should we reset our expectations to now saying, forget getting the four seed. It's likely not going to happen anyways. Don't go all out for that. Just be healthy and fresh with the top six seed by the time the first round starts. Oh. And hopefully they find some magic and make a run. I mean, we have to. I don't think we sh like we if, if I think there's two options, right? Like we have to do that because that's what it feels like it's going to be like. We hope everyone's healthy and we're not in the play in. Kawhi said that what like a month ago yeah. where he was like, we want to be top six. Everyone was like, wait a minute. What? Like, yeah, we, we want said to be top six too. We definitely want to be top six, obviously. We don't want to be in yeah. the plan, basically, is what he was saying. I felt like that was a little bit taken out of context. Like, his point was it just was. like, it's about playing well, right? And not necessarily yeah. about yeah, yeah, yeah. what 
the chips will fall where they may. Historically, it is a little bit about seed as well. <laughs> no, but he just basically seeding would take care of itself if we're improving yeah, and playing both. well. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I guess we have to. So like, yeah, I hope they're fully healthy and not in the plan. I feel horrible <laughs> that that's where we're at. I'm disappointed that we have to do that not because everyone else is just playing on some ungodly level and the Clippers are playing well, but just can't keep up. We have to do that because they've just shit the bed so many times that it's like, well, I guess. Can they beat a fully healthy Minnesota in the first round? No. Right now, as of March 26, 6, 12 p.m., Char, I would not. No, no, no. We're not beating a fully healthy Minnesota in the first round. I think they can, but it's unfounded. And right. I guess it's basically yeah. just going off of Will saying, you know, they have Kawhi. And if you have Kawhi, and if you look at what happened in game one against Phoenix last season, where it did look like they flipped a switch because they were damn sure inconsistent they leading into that first round series. Now they look even probably more inconsistent, or at least it almost feels more. Kawhi looked insane, though, to end that regular season. He was, but he's. Still been pretty insane uh, yeah. for the most part. He hasn't had huge dips in play. Paul George has been way better the last three weeks. That's yeah. what also makes this so perplexing. <laughs> Two on three had what? Uh, extreme efficiency, and both of them had 26 points last night, and they can't beat a Pacers team that doesn't so play you defense. Gotta get stops. You still got to get stops. I, yeah. And they only ended up scoring. What did the Clippers have? 116 or 113? 116. Yeah. That's not a lot in today's league. I think average. I think average is like 112. Right. At least. I mean, they scored 89 points and beat the Wolves. Like, <laughs> that's not going to happen again, I don't think, in the playoffs. Um, uh, yeah. I said at the time that you can't replicate that type of victory. But I still would take my chances if they're fresh, if they're healthy. Sure. Against pretty much anyone but Denver. I and don't like the chances, but yeah, I'll take them. Yeah. It's going to be a war. I mean, what's the other option? <laughs> nope, I won't take the chances. We forfeit. First, I say rescinding our entry into the playoffs. Just I, saying, just move the standings up, Adam. Just Adam Silver. Just remove Roe. Move up. <laughs> I was looking at some of the numbers earlier today. And just how far the drop off has been for this Clippers team offensively, and specifically the starting group, the starting lineup. From December to January, 184 total minutes. The starting lineup had an offensive rating of 128, a defensive rating of 116, which isn't great, but your offensive rating is amazing. So they're plus 12, basically, net rating. They were shooting 54% from the field and 46% from three. And we're a plus 41 in 184 minutes. Since the Grammy road trip, they're shooting just 45% from the field. So almost a 10% drop there in field goal percentage. And just over a 10% drop in three-point percentage from 46.7 to 36.5. And they're just a plus one in their last 192 minutes post-Grammy road trip. The same starting lineup. How could it be that drastic? What's going on there? I know you could say some regression to the mean, but now you're looking at the team that for 50 games this season led the league in three-point shooting. And now over their last 22 games or about, they're shooting 34% on wide open three-pointers. That seems extremely fluky to go from number one for 50 games overall shooting from three and now they can't even hit wide open threes to the point they're the worst shooting team when a defender is six plus feet away in the league over the last 22 games. What? <laughs> Will, we were talking Will. to Justin Russo pregame yesterday, and he was like, maybe they just start making their open threes and everything turns around. Yeah, I mean, that that is the flip side of this, right? Like the team just looks entirely different if they're not the 28th three-point shooting team. Um <laughs> Because it, you know, it has the ripple effect of like obviously making the baskets, but you know, you you're not. You can get more set on defense. You know, you don't have to be rushing around as much. There's like a lot of things that for an older kind of you can slower watch your team, shot if you're Harden and Paul George. Yeah, for like an older kind of slower team, um, 
that make sense that are like you know tangible effects outside of obviously just making more baskets if only it were that simple the getting set on defense thing is huge because ty talked about it pregame which was teams are just attacking the clippers before they're set in defense because they're older and then we watch the pacers do that <laughs> 10 like an hour after he's to rousing success so yeah. incredible success so i totally i i love the point of making those threes lets them actually get back on defense and set will you use this saying or phrase recently they chum the water with how much bad footage they put out there with how many weaknesses they've been showing off over the last three weeks and i think when you do that and teams so easily can key on key in on you with their game plan every night like to prove that that's no longer a weakness it takes so much more teams will keep spamming and attacking that weakness until you yeah, one win over, won't not change, that, yeah, one win isn't going to change it. Like, even if they'd won last night, I mean, obviously, I think we'd all feel a lot different. Um, you know, beating a near, beating an Eastern Conference near playing team, I mean, that'd be huge for the Clippers. Um, but yeah, it, I, I, I agree. Like, it, I mean, the game plan has been set for this team essentially all season long, and they've done, they've, they've been able they have not been able to to rectify it in any meaningful way against an opponent and that's why i'm saying teams like the timberwolves teams like the pelicans um that can play with pace and a lot of physicality uh and a lot of the stuff that have been weaknesses for this team like look yes on on one side of the coin like we are an insane Kawhi leonard playoffs or even getting one of paul george or or harden to pop a, a little bit in in any given game uh, from getting through a playoff series, but at the same time, like you just you look at the weaknesses and what those other teams present, and I got to tell you, like the outlook doesn't it doesn't logically look that great. Will you said something, or actually it was Chuck. You said this last night on Clips and Dip, uh, or Clips and Double Dip on Clippers Talk post game. Don't, don't confuse those intellectual properties, please. Come on. Lawyers are crazy. My bad. My bad. <laughs> we'll drown them in paperwork. Uh, <laughs> you said it. You put into words something I was feeling early on in that game. You said even when they were playing well, it didn't feel real. It didn't feel sustainable, basically. Like, even if one thing's going well for this team right now, something else isn't. And I found that pretty interesting. Like they can't get it all, everybody pointing in the right direction. It's crazy. It's And we, we hope over these last 11 games that they can get it started, pointed in the right direction because there were parts of the team that looked good last night. Um, and then the just it, the defense is just like, <laughs> it's so lost right now. Um, I also, the Pacers played so physically against the Clippers on defense. I'm not sure if they usually play like that. Their defensive rating is what, like 20? They're like bottom five like almost on the season. Sixth or something? Like they're not a very good defense. But they had no fear of being physical with the Clippers. You know what I mean? Like this was a team that clearly read the report. Like Yeah, when they stopped the Clippers' paint attack, because the, the Clippers had nearly doubled the, the Pacers yeah. up in points of the paint, which, I mean, partially was because the Pacers were shooting the, the lights out. They shot as a team like 60-plus percent from three, which, again – it's not an anomaly if it constantly happens to the Clippers, but once they stop that that pain attack, the Clippers, I mean, they were completely anemic on offense and didn't stop anything on the other end. Coach Lou said something interesting post game that didn't make sense to me because the other weird thing about that game last night, you mentioned the hot shooting from the Indiana Pacers, but to your point, if it keeps happening to the Clippers over and over again, maybe it's something they're doing wrong on the perimeter defensively and making it too easy. And they let Tyrese Halliburton, who had only been shooting 22% from three over his last Horrible. 15 games, yeah. he basically was allowed to walk into a three and then got hot. So it's like if the game plan is, oh, this guy isn't shooting well from distance, we're going to play off of him. Well, you give him a couple looks to a guy who typically is a good three-point shooter – then he feels confident. Then they do start working. So it's almost like you got to rip that up. I don't. I don't think well, you know. You're, it just you're totally, playing the it, numbers, but it, it just totally depends on the context. Like, I mean, if it was Daniel Tice taking, like, if he was the opposing player for the play, Pacers taking the threes, he hits three or four of them. Yeah, okay, like that's an anomaly. That sucks. But a guard like who does score and is the you know like a 
the the engine of the offense. Maybe don't let them get into a rhythm scoring wise. Like I, I just don't. Try I, like, harder. Yeah, it just doesn't. Yeah, I don't know. It, subvert it, that. It, it just feels fairly basic, if I'm being totally honest. But the thing Coach Lou said post game because the Clippers only got up 23s. That was the lowest amount they had taken in a game so far this season. And they only hit six of them. So Halliburton hit as many threes as the Clippers did. But he said the reason they only attempted 20 was because obviously they weren't getting into the paint enough to kick it out, spray it out. But the Clippers had 64 points in the paint, right. which is close to a season high. So I didn't, I didn't make, I didn't make sense to me. And now, well, they there, stopped. But... Like the pain penetration stopped in that second, in that second half. Well, it looked I, markedly different. Maybe I thought they had thirty. I thought it was dead even. I thought they had thirty-two points in the paint in the first half and thirty-two points in the paint in the second half, or something like that. Like, oh, did they? It now maybe some of it way. came late once the game got out of hand. To your point, Will. But in speaking to the opponents and how well they're shooting against the Clippers. And oh, what a shock that the team, the only team that is getting lit up more from three is the only team that has been worse defensively than the Clippers over the last 22 games, the Utah Jazz. They're giving up almost 43% to opponents from three. The Clippers are second worst since the Grammy road trip. Teams are shooting 40% from three against them. So... You can make that argument going back to what Justin Russo said. What you stop threes and you start making threes, things could flip quickly. Like if if things were to turn fast, I'm guessing that's how it would happen. Yeah, the threes start falling. And they and not and they stop falling for the opposition. <laughs> yeah. And the threes start falling also because we get lineups that have more than two shooters. <laughs> right? To, again, to your point, to pull a bow on that. Like the, the, we need to see if we're going to see PJ Tucker in the playoffs. I'm I have made my peace with that. Honestly, uh, where are you guys at with that? Because that is still I'm getting all these I'm getting in a day with tweets saying they're seven and thirteen when PJ Tucker plays this season, guys. What are we doing? I mean, yeah, like, I don't know. I, there's just other problems. He's not the biggest problem. There's there's so he much. He played stuff, eleven but, minutes last night. Like, yeah, and and I mean, like they were bad. It, but. it just depends on how you can hide him. Like what what lineups you can put around him, and if we can get anything else out of Tyson Plumley, who you know this wasn't the matchup for them. So. I think that I think that that makes sense. But they have been sort of abysmal of late. Um, so you know if that's the option, I mean, it's not great, but like I said, you know, this team isn't really predicated on depth. That's that's not really how things are going to work out if this team is going to have a deep playoff run. There's going to be eight guys max. Put and, they, and, and maybe P.J. Tucker is one of them on some nights, but I'm yeah. telling you, like, if the eighth guy is the guy tanking your playoff run, like, I think there's probably some bigger issues. You got to put P.J. in a position to succeed. You, for what he does on this team. I'm not saying make him the marquee, obviously, because he will refuse to do that. But put – Play him at the five. Players. Just play him at the five with fucking four – with at least three other shooters on the ground, uh, on the floor. You go Norm, uh -huh. James, Norm, PG, Tucker. You know, some Kawhi. Like, th that's what it is. It's PJ at the five with, <laughs> like – Everyone with except, Kawhi because he generally plays that full yeah. first and full third shifts, and then just, yeah, anyone other than Russ. And well, the you're second. gonna have Russ up there on the floor at some point. I and well, then ideally you wouldn't, but we're they gonna did try. Yeah, they did the try playoffs. him last night at the small ball five a couple times, and Coach Lou talked about it post game and said it wasn't that bad, uh, and it wasn't. I guess. Did you also hear the quote about how he had to wait to do that until Russ came back? <laughs> Yes. So it's like, so you're going to play PJ at the five with Russ out there together. That They're tied to each other in this role, then it seems like. Which I still think Not can work if you have three other shooters. It It's yeah. at least. Yeah, it's viable. But then yeah. it's like, it would have to be like Norm, PG, Kawhi. I and Russ right. and PJ are playing the four or five <laughs> offensively, effectively. <laughs> or it's two fives <laughs> and then like three threes. Um yeah, it was still a negative from the different lineups I'm seeing here from last night with him and he as the small ball five, but it wasn't 
it wasn't what happened to start the fourth quarter either. Like right. they, they were a minus two in about five minutes with him, Russ, Kawhi, Powell, and coffee on the floor. Yeah. But does it speak to the lack of identity and the inconsistency with this team? The fact that, I mean, PJ started right away for the Clippers. He was playing. As soon as they brought him in, he was playing. He was given an opportunity. Then he was out. Now he's back in after talking to the media again, after being disciplined and looks to be secure in a position moving forward with this team. Like it just, I, I don't know the lineup and rotation and the adjustment that's happening right now with 11 games left. We're not fine tuning. <laughs> we're searching for something. It's yeah. Yeah. The like Clippers are hammering. They're not used. They're not fine tuning. They're just bashing the broken thing that they're trying to fix right now. And I don't blame Ty to some extent because he hasn't gotten much consistency even from his stars at times. So you have to try things, but it's not like PJ is a completely different player than. You know, what we obviously said were some issues when you have him out there. And it seems like he's firmly in the rotation now. He's good to go. Yeah. It's not changing, I don't think. No. Tice didn't play last night. <laughs> Tice didn't play. Aren't they the same height? I think PJ might be like two inches shorter. PJ maybe. is, PJ is shorter. Mean, PJ is four inches shorter. So, okay, yeah. yeah what did they yeah, list shorter. Tice as? Six, eight? Six eight, so he's three inches shorter. Yeah, so Tyus is six eight. <laughs> I don't know. The playoff rotation a... is going to be maddening. I know that much. When it's good, we're going to be like, "This makes sense," and when it's bad, we're going to be like, "Why? Why? We know this is bad." Yeah, you're dead on. We, we saw what was good, <laughs> like in the like. You, I want to go back and look at the lineups during the really good stretches and see how many guys actually really did play meaningful minutes. You know what I'm saying? Like Plumley was playing a lot better. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, there were definitely some outliers. In, Everyone in was playing scenario. really good. Amir was shooting crazy again. Plumley missed though a lot of the good stretch for the Clippers because you know he got hurt in game Coen, one yeah. with James Harden. I. Yeah, I I don't know what's going to happen come the playoffs with these rotations right now, and I don't know if the guys know. And I oh, do that's a huge part of it. I think I do wonder if that uncertainty because Coach Lou was brought up post game before. It's not about one of the things he said. It's not about was minutes, how many minutes you get, and then he ended that line with saying it's about winning. It's about sacrificing for the team, and now he's changing sacrifice to investing. And then he also talked about recently how you getting all those individual workouts in and doing your work on the side is different than what you bring to the team. And I'm not sure who that's pointed towards, who he's talking about. Is it multiple oh, guys? <laughs> is it PG? Is it Kawhi? Is it Harden? I don't know. I'm guessing it's a star. It's Bones. It's somebody playing a lot of minutes. <laughs> He's pissed at Bones. Oh, Bones checking out on me. The skeleton Ooh. key. Skeleton, bro. The skeleton key. <laughs> Ooh. I don't know if that one is that. They might have changed the locks on that one. Yeah. That's a bummer. That's a bummer. The locksmith. <laughs> the locksmith. Yeah, Tyler, the locksmith. <laughs> um, yeah, the playoff. Well, the playoff rotations, it's like. We're going to, I can already see it. We're going to go so small against a big team and just get destroyed for that stretch. I mean, unless the three point shooting, I guess, returns, you're just not stopping anything. So, I mean, last the night, like you said, Will, you can't trade buckets down 20. Yeah. I mean, the Timberwolves, I guess, like their big flaw maybe is their offense overall. I mean, but we've seen enough of Ant cooking us. They certainly have weapons, you know, offensively. But it, sure. it's, it's not that, you know, it's not as simple necessarily as just outscore them. Could be if our offense was looking that good, but. Could be the move. Who knows? I, I still wonder how much of it is tired legs and being an older team and how much of it is a lack of effort right now. 
I think I'd feel better if I knew it was a lack of effort. Because that oh, is totally. That's the switch. That's the yeah. switch right there. The effort switch. <laughs> <laughs> no, that like that. Yeah, of course. I would definitely feel feel way better about that. And said they're just old. Do we know that? But it kind of goes back to my. It, is? it kind of goes back to my thing about this. Uh, my central thesis is like I I still can't tell what's worse is like if they don't care about the regular season or if they think they've done enough. And I still think that the latter is probably worse. I think the latter is probably worse if you're assuming right now after two months of good play, hey, we're good. I've seen enough. Like I think that that's – I just think that that's like criminally delusional. Let me just put on my be good pants today. Yeah. We're good. Nah, we're good. We're good, Adam. (laughs) <laughs> the nasty <We're> good. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was coming. <laughs> the, <laughs> the nastiness to the play and how quickly it changed almost feels like they did flip a switch just in the wrong direction. <laughs> yeah. And if you can do that, you can you can turn it back on, baby. Even, even you a can blind turn it back squirrel. on. Um, all right, so to close out the playoff segment before we do a brand new segment after this set of ads, uh, will give us a one sentence as of March 26, 6 33 p.m. Give us a one your one sentence, maybe two sentence outlook on the Clippers playoff, uh, on the Clippers seating. <laughs> we're good, we're good, Clippers 2024. We're good. <laughs> They have they have perhaps broken the paint in the wrong way. Um, <laughs> coming up, we're gonna we got a fun new segment, just some fun facts. Um, we're gonna do, and then then we're gonna close out the show with some Adam positivity. Uh, if you're listening to the show, thank you. If you're watching, thank you as well. We got some ads coming up; they might be loud for those listening. If that's been the case for you, go ahead and turn it down. We got ads, and then some fun facts in three, two. Hey, it's Clips and Dip, Season 2, Episode 63. I'm Adam Moslin. We got Chuck Mockler and Will Updike. If you missed the Clips and Double Dip last night, post game, we didn't have the technology to bring them both on, but we did have Chuck Mockler on, who gave great analysis on a game that even if the Clippers had won, we wouldn't have said, oh, everything's, everything's fine now. They're good to go. It's going to take a lot more to restore faith in this fan base for the most part. And... It des- it's deserved with what we have seen since the Grammy road trip. But, Charles, I know we're trying to bring some levity to everything that's happening right now, so why don't you uh, introduce this new segment here? Yeah, this new segment is called uh, Clipper Ship Facts. That We're just going to educate some people on clipper ships. Um, these are some facts. If any of you two want to jump in uh, with basic questions or to read the next facts, feel free. Um, first one, a lot of people don't really know how the clipper ship evolved. It actually started from the small, swift coastal packet known as the Baltimore Clipper. The true Clipper uh, evolved first in America and then later in the British shipyards, of course. Uh, And the emphasis on speed came partly from the desire to bring the first tea of the season back from China. We all know how good that tea is. First tea of the season. Very valuable. Got to get it back while it's still in season, right? Got to get it back. Um, So what were ships doing before this? They were just all huge they're like let's build the biggest ship ever i think they just they gave them really long mechanical legs so they could touch the bottom of the ocean and they would walk and then they figured but what out what about the, the first thing. ships wouldn't the first ships have been small yeah i don't think anyone's going to argue with you on that what's the distinct like what's the distinguishing line between a like say a sick kayak and a clipper is it just a mast poop deck i think there's a poop deck involved uh as big on any kayak <laughs> Very or true. canoe. Another or fact. Body, or bodyboard. <laughs> <laughs> Another ship fact. Um, oftentimes, a clipper will be confused with a wind jammer, and these people don't even. I hate when me, people do that. Don't even get me fucking started. Uh, they're two completely different types of ship. Clippers were optimized for speed only and carrying highly priced cargo on small quantities such as tea spices or opium. Hey, hey. A windjammer, of course, is a large sailing ship optimized for cargo capacity, ease of handling, and carrying low-priced bulk cargo, such as your lumber and fertilizers. 
the more you, you know. imagine like being on a ship in oldie times and like you have like a huge ship full of fertilizer like that's your life <laughs> you get used you, to it i live next to a horse corral thing over here have you ever heard of press gangs yes it was when they would round up people to unwillingly become sailors so they would like go to bars and find drunk people and then you would wake up on a ship and, and you're a sailor like, now well, you signed this waiver just last night <laughs> yeah oh, you hey, don't congrats, remember man you're on the Trust ship me, now you were of sound mind uh and then the final they beat the, final... the shit out of you and say you sail now and you're like Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> and then the final fact uh we just have some records here um the fastest voyage from new york to san francisco was done in 1851 by the flying cloud in a record 89 days uh and the james baines no one's been able to beat that never uh set the transatlantic sailing record uh for 12 days and six hours from boston to liverpool unbelievable i heard the flying cloud was so fast an old man couldn't even yell at it and shake his fist hell yeah <laughs> Hell yeah. Surprise <laughs> no one's going going for that. Why aren't we pushing the limits of ships anymore? I say bring yeah, bring this back. Especially after what just happened in Baltimore. Let's let's, let's rethink great. ships. I think we could do better. I think Good we kind of stopped over there. We yeah, really, let's bring we really took our foot off the gas as far as ships are concerned. Yeah, I agree with that. Electric ships, e ships. E ships. Interesting. Um, let's bring back oldie time planes too. Those are fun. <laughs> Boeing's already doing that. <laughs> yeah, Boeing. with loose safety regulations. <laughs> yeah, they're doing the old kind of planes where they, yeah, where they're just not uh, having. Came from a kit. Their job. I ordered in the mail. <laughs> it cost me the kit cost me twelve bucks. But the planes worth like ten million yeah. once I build it. Um, all right. Any more thoughts on Clippers ships before we make Adam give us a positive vibe before heading out? Oh, that wasn't it. <laughs> No, it felt it felt more positive than anything else that happened in this episode. I loved it, Chuck. All right, there we go. <laughs> All right, I got uh, something. I got something. I got problem. something. I got something. I got something. Let me make something up here. Uh, no, I said this last night, and I do kind of believe it. The Clippers are embarking on a four-game road trip. I actually think it's a good time to get away, band together, hunker down. Getting that bunker, getting that foxhole together on the road, like when they went six and one on the Grammy road trip. Maybe it's coming full circle now. This is exactly what they need to find themselves a tough road trip. Yeah. All right. The tough cloud. road trip. <laughs> and they're taking the cloud ship to get there. The flying cloud. The flying cloud. On the flying cloud to Philadelphia. Uh, Adam, thank you for the positive vibes we hope everyone listening is having a good start to their week despite what the clippers are doing uh we're gonna be back with a double dip after the game in philly we're doing a live hang on saturday it's hopefully gonna be more fun than the last couple lives we've had because those have been fun in a much different way um we need some reviews will where can people review this or watch this or listen to this if they want to switch it up uh, you can review this show over on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. You can listen to this show wherever you get your podcast. If you want to check this show out visually, you can do that over at youtube.com slash at Clippers Podcast. And uh, you can't leave a review there, but you can leave a little comment on any video, if you please, and we'll see it. Uh, we'll also see any comments you make on the internet over uh, on at X or Twitter. Any uh, comment. That's Just... at Clippers Pod. Yep. We're searching through your we're searching through your info we got all the info uh so go ahead and follow that account and we will uh we'll take a perusal of your personal accounts we will be in touch um uh, yeah hope everyone has a good rest of your week we'll talk to you soon follow adam a over on x.com um and as always let's go clips